maybe today as I kind of go through some of uh, what MaxPoint does, some of the problems that we deal with, um, yeah, you'll come to realize like how I end up here. It's such an interesting um, area, right? Like, and there's lots of just neat problems going on. And uh, I hope to kind of give you a flavor of that uh, today. Okay, so what, is, uh, what does MaxPoint do? I often get asked that question. MaxPoint actually does uh, a lot of different things. Um, so, you know, if you ask um, different employees uh, of MaxPoint, uh, you know, you'll probably get a slightly different nuanced answer. Um, but, you know, the marketing tagline goes, you know, uh, we provide a leading business intelligence and digital marketing solution that enables national brands to drive local in-store sales. Um, my take on it is that, um, you know, there's a, a really key part here is that uh, you're using advertising to drive people to show up uh, in actual stores, right? So that link that MaxPoint provides between online advertising and physical, um, physical foot traffic, getting people to go out and into actual stores is a very important uh, um, a distinction, I guess, uh, for what MaxPoint does. Um, at its core, what makes MaxPoint interesting is that, um, yeah, we rely and uh, operate on um, our, these real-time bidding exchanges. So uh, I never knew this before, actually, until, you know, um, you know, finding out about MaxPoint and then interviewing with them and then uh, eventually uh, taking a job with them, that there's this, yeah, there's this fascinating thing that goes on uh, when you load up a web page. So, um, for example, if you're su surfing a web page, you've probably noticed that, okay, like in this example, along the top, there's, uh, you know, an ad for some sort of HD technology. There's an ad space on the right side there. So you've noticed this before as you're, as you're surfing. But what you may not know is that as a web page is loading up in that fraction of a second, there's actually an, a real-time auction that goes on where uh, there's all, you know, types of... Um, I want to say people, but more often than not, it's probably algorithms like, uh, that are trying to bid uh, for the right to display an ad in one of those placements. Um, so this, this, uh, this flow diagram tries to kind of illustrate sort of like what's going on there. So yeah, okay, in the top corner, you see the web page is coming up. Uh, An auction gets kicked off. Um, Everybody that's subscribing to the ad exchanges that run these, uh, these auctions, they get notified um, that, hey, there's an auction going on. Um, and then it's up to folks that participate in these auctions, like MaxPoint, to make that decision. Okay, do we want to bid on this uh, opportunity to serve ads in these places? Uh, and if so, how much money do we want to pay uh, to make that bid? Um, so that's the basic mechanism, but uh, what I find really interesting is that, you know, aside from MaxPoint participating in these auctions as a way of delivering advertising to, um, you know, to consumers, um, it's also, also like a really great opportunity for MaxPoint to uh, collect data. So uh, in each of these bid requests, yeah, there may be uh, some information about who is surfing uh, the web, There'll be information about, okay, which website it is that these placements are available on. And sometimes even things like, oh, which was the page that kind of referred um, the user to this current page. Um, so, you know, as this, uh, as this data becomes available and archived, uh, slowly you kind of can piece together a picture of uh, the person who's surfing the web, like what their behaviors and preferences might be. Um, as you can imagine, like, uh, the internet is vast. Um, if, you know, there's all kinds of auctions going on, uh, they ha I mentioned they have to happen extremely quickly so that the consumer um, well, still gets their web page on time. Um, but also, yeah, uh, when, when we store all this data and um, have it available, it's, it's massive, right? So, like, uh, truly, MaxPoint is uh, dealing with, like, big data in every sense of the word. And you know some of these interesting numbers include that you know we work with 60 billion uh, bid opportunities per day, and uh, we're making like you know more than 12 trillion calculations per day. So, um, so of course this means that uh, all this participation in these auctions it's not done manually, right? There's no way it could happen. It's it's done algorithmically. Um, at this point, I just want to pause and maybe um, you know one of the things I noticed about 
um, when I first started working at Max Point was there's a lot of jargon in this industry. Um, and I think over time I've absorbed it too. Uh, but, you know, uh, at risk of like, you know, using terms that you may not be familiar with because you don't work in advertising necessarily, I was just going to like rifle through some of them. Uh, you probably hear me use the word user. Uh, when I say user, I'm, I mean the person that's surfing the web, the consumer. Uh, when I talk about placements, I mean like those spots on the website like uh, where you can place an ad. Um, request is like the request uh, that the ad exchange makes like, for people to participate in the bids, uh, bidding process. Uh, and an imp ad impression is uh, what occurs when, uh, say, MaxPoint wins uh, the auction, then they have the right to kind of put this ad, uh, insert this ad uh, impression into the placement that they've won. Um, clicks, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. If there's an ad there, if a user clicks on it, that's what I'm talking about there. Um, but the term conversion, that one is a bit more fluid. Uh, basically, when I use the word conversion, I'm uh, referring to the outcome that uh, our clients desire. So, um, so maybe someone's running an um, ad campaign for diapers, and the conversion there might be that, um, you know, the client wants someone to click on the ad, go to their website, and purchase diapers, for instance. Um, there's some common metrics that are used uh, to kind of evaluate performance in these ad campaigns. One of the ones that's most relevant to this talk is probably uh, cost per action, or CPA. So it's really just uh, the cost of serving ads divided by like how many actual conversions that you get. Um, and finally, you'll hear me use the word pixel. Um, You've probably been familiar with the word pixel, like in terms of like looking at displays and all that. Uh, in this case, uh, a pixel is something used uh, to allow um, you know someone to know where a user's been on a on a website that doesn't necessarily have ad placements. And uh, literally, it is a one by one uh, pixel image uh, in the form of a URL. But what happens is when one of these pages loads up with a pixel on there, that request gets logged somewhere, so you know that this person. Uh, attempted to access that page. Okay, so yeah, that's a bit of a, about the background of uh, where Max Point's coming from, and uh, you know, in terms of the online advertising business that we participate in. Um, I wanted to now kind of delve into okay, where does the machine learning part uh, come into play? Um, so I mentioned algorithms uh, being important, um, and you know, if you've taken any sort of machine learning courses or statistics or anything, uh, you can kind of uh, think of many of the problems that we're trying to solve uh, as uh, supervised learning problems, right? So um, you're basically defining an objective. In, in this case, maybe yeah, you want to minimize CPA or maximize clicks, or maybe just serve like um, as many ads to as many people as possible, like if it's an awareness campaign. Um, and yeah, you're trying to like uh, predict the likelihood if you serve an ad that you know you will achieve. This, uh, this outcome that you desire. Um, how do we come up with uh, this uh, prediction, right, that the outcome will, uh, will occur? Uh, we have a bunch of, you know, I mentioned we store all types of uh, information that we come across, like in these, um, uh, during the course of these auctions. And you can kind of think about uh, these different features uh, in three different domains. Like, you'll have a picture coming together of like what the users' behaviors and preferences are. Uh, you also know the website that they're, they're surfing. So, you know, maybe this website is a news site, or maybe they're uh, like versus like a sports site or an entertainment site. And also, you have characteristics associated with the advertising campaign uh, that you're trying to run. So, maybe this campaign is, you know, I mentioned selling diapers or maybe selling TVs, and you know, the confluence of all those three different things um, might affect uh, the likelihood that if you know serve an ad, that you'll get a um, a beneficial result. Uh, in my work, I focus more on that user box. Um, you know, a lot of the work I do involves trying to make predictions and about what the user will do, and to try to further understand the, their behaviors and characteristics. Uh, even that particular box uh, on the previous slide uh, breaks up into multiple perspectives as well. Um, so, for example. If we're trying to predict whether a user is going to convert when we serve them an ad, we might, uh, you know, look at things like, oh, what's their location, uh, which is very important for Max Point if we're trying to drive uh, people to actually go physically visit stores. Um, you know, I mentioned their interests, um, 
their demographics, so whether they're male, female, what age, that sort of thing. Even things like weather, right? In the, if we know their location, might come into play uh, and affect the, the likelihood of a positive outcome uh, if we serve an ad. Um, what I've wanted to focus a bit more on today is uh, this concept of uh, retargeting. Uh, that's, um, I think it's just got some interesting properties, like that problem that, um, yeah, we can kind of go through. And um, it's more nuanced than uh, I first expected anyway. All right. So what is retargeting? Um, oh, I got some chuckles from this. It's not as, um, okay, I don't think it's as nefarious as uh, perhaps uh, your, your laugh might allude to. But um, so, okay, so here's like, uh, you know, a dictionary or like a marketing spiel definition of what retargeting is. Uh, it's a form of online uh, advertising, as it mentions. Uh, but really, if I were to kind of break it down, like really what you're concerned with is if you know that a user has been to your client's website already, uh, and then they left, you know that they were kind of like interested in, in the product or service or whatever that they were surfing on the site. And the idea is that if they've left, you can serve them an ad if they pop up while surfing like Yahoo News later or surfing some other unrelated uh, website and give them an ad there to try to get them to come back. Let me try to make this really concrete. So um, on that first page I showed, yeah, there is like, um, you know, a, the Yahoo News page and there were ad slots that were showing like LG ads. Um, this might be like what, uh, for example, an LG uh, website could look like. Um, and I say it's hypothetical and actually that applies to kind of most of this presentation. I mean, you know, I want to give you a flavor of what MaxPoint does, but I don't necessarily want to give away all the marbles, uh, so to speak. Um, so anyway, uh, I might be deliberately vague in some cases. Um, but okay, say I'm interested in uh, buying a 4K TV. So I might have, you know, uh, gone to LG's website, their landing page. I might then surf around uh, for different products that LG carries, like different TVs and that sort of thing. And um, on this website, there may be a page where you can actually then look up where this product is carried. And that's probably, in this case, like what the client, uh, LG, is interested in having consumers do, right? Um, to actually go to that page, look up where to buy the TV, and then physically go buy it. Um, so if I had found a particular TV I was interested in, and just right when I'm about to go and locate where I can purchase it, but then my wife you know, asked me to go take out the garbage or something, um, and then I get distracted essentially, right? Um, LG would want to run sort of this retargeting uh, perspective, this model, right, to kind of, um, yeah, get me to kind of come back, right, uh, and finish, uh, finish what I was doing. Um, and, you know, like, yeah, that, that laugh that you had, you know, that hinted to uh, this being sort of a, a nefarious sort of thing, I think it's actually uh, can be quite beneficial to consumers as well. Because, you know, if you kind of think about it, like, if I think back to, like, mail, like, uh, every time I go to my mailbox, I'm carrying, like, armloads of ads, like, to the garbage because they're just not relevant to me at all. Um, and also, you know, I don't have kids, like in uh, online advertising, if someone served me a diaper ad, I probably would not respond to it and might find it annoying. Um, a lot of these models, what they do is, uh, yeah, try to detect your interests. So we actually, you know, serve ads to you that you would potentially find useful and interesting as well. So there is a possibly positive spin on this. Um, so this example back here, uh, it generalizes to this concept of, um, you've probably heard the term, or maybe, maybe not, but uh, a conversion funnel. And the idea being that at the top, you have like kind of the initial pages on the website. Uh, and as you get deeper and deeper into the website, you get closer to uh, a page that is useful for a conversion action, uh, but it's much harder to get a user there uh, than to the top. And at any point in this chain, um, the user might leave and a uh, retargeting model would be useful to get them to come back again. Okay, so uh, I think I've laid out the basic problem as a supervised um, yeah, learning problem, uh, particularly uh, in the realm of classification. Um, I just wanted to start delving into maybe like what an implementation might actually look like. So um, I think, yeah, most people are probably familiar with this idea of like a uh, machine learning pipeline. So 
you know, you get data, uh, you might pre-process that data, normalizing features, like that sort of thing, dummy coding stuff if it's categorical. Um, then you probably have uh, some cross-validation to tune your hyperparameters, uh, get the best uh, mm -hmm. configuration of the model, um, and then you kind of want to test it, uh, test the predictions that this model creates against a holdout sample to really evaluate you know, whether it's doing its job well or not. Uh, with retargeting, the data that goes into this model um, might look like something like this, right? You probably, um, so over time, you've probably uh, amassed a whole bunch of records uh, for a user about like whether, you know, which pages that they visited and at what time on a client's website. Um, you probably could like summarize that, you know, like, and aggregate some of those features, getting things like, okay, number of times they've been on the website, uh, which particular pages as indicated by a pixel, um, and, you know, the time of their first visit and versus the time of their last visit. And from there, those yeah, might be some useful features for helping you make a, an accurate prediction um, in terms of what will happen when you serve them an ad, like whether they'll come back or not. Um, and in terms of using this data, uh, one, uh, one library that could be quite useful is um, Scikit-Learn. There's like tons of machine learning um, algorithms in there. It's really well documented. And this is an example, like maybe uh, you might, in this case, set up a logistic regression, uh, have a bunch of different uh, parameters in there that you would have tuned during the cross-validation stage. And there you go. Uh, once you have uh, tested that model, you might want to test it against uh, a bunch of different uh, models, uh, different approaches as well. Um, and, you know, I showed logistic regression previously, but things, other things I could apply here are uh, decision trees, uh, random forests were hot at the time, uh, but, you know, I think Kaggle communities moved on to other things as well. Um, and, you know, in this particular problem, uh, survival models might actually also be something you'd consider um, just because of the time component and uh, data censoring, which I'll kind of talk a bit more about in a bit. Um, and once you have these models, uh, yeah, you basically have this bake-off, right? Just, um, you know, have them all make predictions and then compare them against the actual outcome. Um, and a useful way of doing that uh, is possibly using ROC curves, which is also a feature inside of scikit-learn. Um, and you can kind of plot them out, but really the important feature is like how much area do you have underneath that curve? And basically, the higher the curve goes up, you have more area underneath and uh, suggesting better uh, performance of the model. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like a basic uh, classification pipeline that could apply to this problem. Um, but with retargeting, yeah, I, was in, I mentioned that I was interested in talking about this one because it's got some uh, nuances to it. Um, particularly, if you're going to roll up uh, some of this data, aggregate some of this data, like trying to get like, you know, the first time you saw the user versus the last time and how many times you've seen them. Um, there's some inherent limitations to how effectively you can do that. Um, so uh, that might be, limit. that limitation might be the, the size of the time window that you're going to retrieve data on these users for. And because of that, um, you know, what I'm trying to show here is that between those dashed lines, that's the time window. But the first time the user was on the site might not be within that window of data that you're actually grabbing. Um, and furthermore, um, what the circles show, the, um, the clear circles, those would be instances where um, the user uh, went to the conversion uh, site, or the conversion page, rather. And um, again, similar, you might not see that happening, right, because of the, the time window that you've taken. And, you know, and it was these type of considerations that yeah, made me think of, like, you know, survival model, right? Uh, the other thing is that, yeah, there's severe class skew inherent to this type of data. Um, if, you know, uh, maybe I can have a show of hands. How many people here have clicked on an ad uh, in the past week, like when you were surfing the web? <laughs> okay, and touch, or if you have fat fingers, you know, on your phone or whatever. But, um, yeah, it's like a rare event, right? I saw, you know, like a few people put up their hand, but it's not actually that common. And, um, you know, to deal with that, uh, you really have to think carefully about, you know, uh, strategies like are you going to oversample the data to compensate, uh, employ some sort of weighting scheme, and that sort of thing as well. 
I mentioned scikit-learn, and you know, this is a PyData conference, so maybe I'll stop and just kind of say, oh yeah, well, uh, Python certainly uh, factors heavily into uh, MaxPoint's uh, pipeline, um, both for prototyping and you know, and further along in the production process. Uh, the tools and environments uh, that come along with those tools that are most interesting are, of course, you know, uh, Python itself, but the Jupyter notebooks. Pandas uh, for you know its data frames and ancillary capabilities. Um, I mentioned survival. That one was a bit more difficult in that it's not natively supported in Scikit-Learn. But then Python also um, has other packages. But also, if you really wanted to use R, for instance, you could also call out to R and do some of your work there. Um, and of course, uh, Matplotlib is a, you know a very common visualization tool that we also enjoy. Further considerations for this model that we had to grapple with were, um, so Max Point, um, if we are you know, creating models, uh, I mentioned that we have to kind of factor in that you know, uh, these models might perform differently for different types of advertising campaigns. And um, we often, uh, therefore, have to have a very wide feature set to accommodate for different, um, different possible conditions, like for uh, for different um, between advertising campaigns. Uh, the problem with having a super wide feature set, though, is that you have high dimensionality and therefore uh, risk of overfit. Um, and you know, just as a reminder, like overfit is like when the decision surface that you're trying to fit um, or, the, or the surface of best fit is just kind of overly uh, reactive to like error and randomness in the data. Um, and yeah, therefore, uh, having some sort of regularization scheme was extremely important like for um, creating a, a model uh, to deal with this problem. Um, particularly uh, interesting was that um, you know, L1 and L2 are common regularization schemes, but um, L2 was actually uh, a better choice in this situation just because it, uh, it actually fits a lot faster than the L1. And also, if you have collinear features, uh, it's more useful sometimes to kind of retain those features and push them both to be small rather than discarding one of them. Um, and also, because of the, uh, the skew, the class skew I mentioned, and the rareness of the, of the conversion events, um, even with a regularization scheme, there could still be overfitting uh, after the fact. And uh, you know, here you kind of can start thinking like, a, you know, about properties of the models that you employ themselves. Uh, so for example, um, logistic regression, just because it is a linear model, uh, might just naturally be uh, less likely to overfit than something like a decision tree, which is gonna be just kind of more um, reactive to changes in your data. Um, and then finally, you could also uh, think about using some sort of ensembling scheme um, on top of your model. Uh, and in this case, I just wanted to kind of demonstrate, um, you know, a bagging classifier actually might help um, to kind of limit uh, the overfit. Uh, and really what that does is that it takes your base classifier, um, it copies it, in this case, like 10 times, and then, but each of those, um, those copies has like a slightly different feature set that's randomly selected from the original. And it kind of has the effect of smearing your decision uh, boundary a bit uh, to make it less likely to overfit. And you know, back to this point about you know we run many advertising campaigns simultaneously. Um, as you kind of move away from this kind of prototyping phase and you know start considering um, production or testing your solution across many different uh, campaigns, then you know, the problems of scale uh, start to come into play. Um, and you really need to start thinking about like uh, running some of these models in uh, parallel, perhaps. Um, and I think these days there's like plenty of uh, opportunities to parallelize things. So like, you know, if you're on a Hadoop cluster, yeah, you can kind of think of uh, doing stuff on the cluster via MapReduce. Um, Spark is increasingly making that sort of thing easier. Uh, but, but if you're still interested in parallelizing uh, parts of uh, your pipeline on uh, like in an offline sense, um, Python actually has a really nice uh, multiprocessing. Um, library that kind of helps handle that sort of thing. Um, so for this chunk of code, you, you know, basically the important part is like where it says num cores, like that's basically just kind of saying like how many um, parallel pieces uh, 
do you have available to run your model? And uh, the pool call, it basically is, creates like this pool of workers um, that maps to the, the number of cores variable there. And uh, there's a dot map method that you can pass to pool uh, and give it a list of uh, things that you want the, the pool to work through. And pool nicely kind of handles like dividing up this work in the lists between uh, all your different workers. All right, so um, yeah, I just, today I just wanted to kind of give you a slice of what MaxPoint does, how it kind of translates to machine learning. And, um, you know, while working in this space, I guess I would say that um, it's interesting in that, you know, we have this uh, standard concept of what a machine uh, learning pipeline looks like, but um, the business problem and the data um, involved can really kind of emphasize different parts of that pipeline and, and uh, force you to think about different solutions around that. Um, in kind of working on this uh, type of problem, I found that, uh, yeah, some of your res results may actually defy your initial expectations. So uh, being able to rapidly prototype solutions and test them against each other and evaluate them is uh, extremely important um, with an emphasis maybe on the, the rapid part. Um, and, you know, Python is, uh, you know, it's been a great environment to kind of help facilitate that happening. Um, and this space, it seems to be kind of just changing very rapidly uh, as we go along. Uh, there's always like new tools and things coming up, um, but it seems like, uh, yeah, Python's kind of been quite firmly adopted by the data science community and uh, will continue to be a, a part of it going forward. So uh, that's all I had. Um, if you have any questions and comments, uh, please let me know. I also uh, wanted to let you guys know that if you're interested, we're hiring, so feel free to, uh, you know, uh, let me know if you're interested. And also we have a booth outside, uh, where uh, Zach will be uh, taking questions and comments as well. Thank you. Uh, do you find models that take into account feature interactions very useful or, or do you treat them mostly independent and get most of the gains out of that? It is, it is useful. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, it is, it is useful. Um, and you know, where we can, like we try to like pull that in as well. Um, but it really kind of multi, uh, expands your, your feature space like very rapidly. So you sometimes have to be probably a bit more, um, investigative up front before you know, trying to incorporate like everything in that regard. Does um, that sort of answer your question? Okay, good. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that um, when an ad is about to come up, you get a notification and you want to use an algorithm to figure out whether to bid for this or how much to bid for this. Mm -hmm. uh, what wasn't clear was what are the features that you use? Do you do some NLP on the text of the ad or and you mentioned about user behavior. Mm -hmm. How do you get to model user behavior? Uh, how do you extract these features? And sure, are uh, there any public data resources to play with these kinds of things? I work with medical imaging and machine learning, but I'm not familiar with this kind of data. Yeah, no, fair enough. And like part of it is like you know, I mentioned yeah, like maybe I'm sort of like being opaque about it because I don't want to give away all the marbles. But also like the other part is it's just. Uh, Max point, the machinery we set up, it's, it's actually really complicated now, right? There's just tons of stuff going on. Um, as for data, though, if you wanted to play on your own, like definitely Kaggle, I've seen stuff come up on there. Um, yeah, you can probably grab some of the data sets still, um, yeah, and, and kind of mess around. But, you know, back to your first part of the question, yeah, like is there you know, all this type of analysis going on? Uh, Yes, <laughs> right, like there's like, yeah, but you know, I probably can't get into, into the scope of this. Hi, um, so I was curious, so with all this retargeting and um, display ads, you're creating a lot of, you're trying to create a lot of demand for products, right? Um, so you're trying to drive traffic to stores. So do you do also do something to um, manage the supply side? Uh, so that the demand is met. So how do you uh, balance these things? Yeah, and like I didn't have a chance to get into this at all um, in this presentation, but certainly, yeah, I think what you're alluding to is that, um, you know, uh, you, 
yeah, you, there's like a finite supply and you may want to kind of spread it out and that sort of thing. And there are considerations. Um, not, you know, and I, I think, um, you know, in terms of what I work on, I, I'm, I kind of showed that, you know, we've carved it up into different spaces. And I am relatively free to kind of like work on the user audience uh, side of things. But yeah, there's other, um, other folks that, you know, kind of work on, on those other pieces and it all kind of comes <laughs> together. Um, usually there's some sort of un ensembling scheme in the end. Hey, uh, you hey. mentioned that you train models on occasionally larger feature spaces to be sort of uh, suitable for many types of scenarios. What's the benefit of that versus maybe doing something like applying higher level business rules and training multiple models? Uh, can you give me an example? Like how do you... <laughs> Basically, like if you already know that you expect a certain campaign to have different conditions or behave differently than a different campaign, maybe you would train a totally different model and just apply sort of a filter or a rule sure. on, on top of that to actually route to the correct model. Yeah, I gotcha. Um, yeah, I mean, part of it is just that, yeah, the, the advertising campaigns we work with, they often are very different, right? Like, it's just, it, it is difficult to, I think, anticipate up front, uh, like every sort of possible permutation. Um, so that's kind of been the, yeah, the main sort of driver to kind of do it this way. Like, it's more of like a brute force approach, I think, like, uh, yeah, uh, in, versus what you're alluding to, right? Um, but yeah, that's, that's sort, of sort of the situation. Yes. Um, is there any value for your clients in not just predicting the behavior of your client, of the customer, the user, but describing the ideal behaviors of the user as a, in a more general strategic sense? And if so, do you build any kind of descriptive models around that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, you know, well, I, I could go back to the uh, beginning slide, but you know, part of the description of what Max Point is is that we're also like a business intelligence company. So while I focused on the online advertising piece, certainly yeah, our clients are are interested in in uh, those types of questions, those types of models, and and we definitely have folks uh, that kind of provide that type of service. Yes. Hi. Uh, so I guess with uh, advertising, there's a lot of like privacy issues that come into it. Um, and it seems like a general principle is like, don't collect data or features if you're not going to use them. So I was wondering what thought goes into like choosing which features you're going to track and um, like sure. beforehand. Yeah, the industry is uh, self-regulating uh, in that regard. Um, but yeah, there are like yeah, ground rules for doing this sort of thing. Um, the, the one thing I didn't mention is that, you know, um, Participation in in these type of auctions, like in the sense of like you know sharing your your info about where you've been uh, on the web and that sort of thing, um, yeah, like it's you can opt out of that, right? And yeah, we definitely respect that decision uh, by the user. Right? So um, yeah, and then outside of that, you know, even if we if you are opted in, yeah, there's certainly limits on like uh, you know ethically and and legally, right? That we would uh, respect. Oh, I have a question. Not sure whether you know the answer. So how does the retargeting work? So basically your company provides a library for your customer to load into their website and then their website will store a cookie in, on the uh, browser of the, their users, right? Mm -hmm. But um, when the, uh, your, your customers and user use uh, the website, how is the uh, retargeting get triggered? Let's say if I'm going to Amazon, uh, browse a, let's say, a TV, mm -hmm. and then I go to a Sydney news uh, website. And how is that retargeting triggered by the cookie that I'm interested in such product? Oh, in sure. a different website. Yeah, I'll try to explain that. Um, so yeah, and, and cookie is just like, you know, a, a type of identifier. Retargeting actually can work on, you know, like using other methods of identification as well. But um, so basically, yeah, that scenario you mentioned, like you were on Amazon, at that point, yeah, that is recorded, right? Like, uh, if we're running this retargeting model. And the idea is that later, okay, we've stored that in a, probably like a table somewhere. Um, but, you know, later in an online auction, if your identification comes up again, right? Like, we know that, hey, yeah, uh, you're now surfing, uh, I don't know, CNN. Um, we would identify you at that time and match it with the fact that, hey, we have a record of you on Amazon before. 
And then that would trigger us to kind of apply this retargeting methodology, right? To kind of uh, consider whether we should serve you an ad that using this method. Does that make sense? Like, or am I? <laughs> I saw the um, the uh, retargeting advertisement is kind of embedded uh, in a news website, not really as a bubble information or something. So I was wondering how that got embedded into a different company's website when retargeting happens or occurs. Oh, okay. I think you're talking about like native ads, like where it looks like it's part of the content. Is that what you mean? Like. Um... Okay. Well, we can maybe chat after, yeah, then we can try to, yeah, I'll try to get a better understanding of, yeah. So I, I just have it. one uh, specific question for the model. So before the user getting to the final page, uh, we call it the action page, right? Action page. And so by looking at that conversion funnel, the user need to go through page one, page two, page uh, X minus one. Mm -hmm. So in your model, uh, you have your uh, label or target zero and one. Uh, is zero means uh, getting to the, the, so we are estimating the likelihood to, for the users getting to the next page or the final page? Um, the final page I was describing there, right? Okay. Uh, but, you know, I think you're alluding to the fact that, hey, yeah, this funnel is more than just the beginning page and the final page. There's all these pages in between that it may be useful to know whether you hit those two, but you could actually use those as features, um, you know, categorical features, if you will, or counts. Uh, you um, sort of described a static kind of learning use case. Mm -hmm. uh, do you do also online learning on streaming data? For example, your model predicts that you should go for this bit, but it didn't work out. That's, does that result get fed back immediately to the machine learning algorithm and gets better, this kind of active learning strategy? Yeah, uh, yeah I know what you're referring to, and, uh, you know, Maybe, yes, <laughs> possibly. So. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to know, out of curiosity, do you have internal bidding wars between your different campaigns but in, within MaxPoint? <laughs> um, there's like, machine. You need to optimize that. Um, I'm trying to think offhand. But yeah, we have like machinery to kind of handle that case. But yeah. Um, I just know that I can I can see the output like, in terms of the scores or the predictions like from a bunch of different models. But yeah, there is uh, machinery to kind of like yeah handle those type of conflicting interests, if you will. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for the wonderful and very insightful talk. A round of applause for the speaker, please. Okay.